for a mathematician or a physicist, a network is a very simple object. It's just a bunch of nodes connected by links. There are many examples of networks around us. Think of the World Wide Web, where, whose nodes are web pages connected by the URLs, the type of things that you click on to go from one page to the other one. Think of Facebook or the social network in general, whose nodes are individuals and links correspond to the friendships and acquaintance link we have among each other. Or even think of what happens within ourselves, the 20,000 genes that we all have and the linkages between them that are responsible for life as we know it. The bottom line, we are surrounded by networks much of our technology, learning, and existence depends on network, and our very biological existence really depends on multiple networks. We need to understand that, because without them, we cannot make sense of the complex world around us. Networks were around us for billions of years, and the study of networks is not particularly new either. In the 1960s, mathematicians, graph theorists, have been fascinating by how to describe complex network. And that was a time when what we call today the random network theory was born, thanks to the work of two Hungarian mathematicians, Paul Erdős and Alfred Rényi. What they assumed is that we as physicists or mathematicians, we do not know how the nodes really connect to each other, that how nature and technology chooses to link its nodes together. However, we know that it's very complicated, so the best way is to assume that these linkages are random. Hence, random network theory was born, which assumes that you have a bunch of nodes and you randomly place links between them. For example, you meet randomly people on the street or may and may not become friends with them. Your molecules may randomly encounter another molecule and may or may not be able to react to them. Once random network theory was born, it made a number of fascinating predictions about how real networks should look like. One of the most important predictions it made was that despite the fact that every node randomly chooses its links, at the end, the overall network will be very democratic. This means that the vast majority of the nodes will have approximately the same number of links. It follows what in mathematics we call a Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution makes a prediction that the vast majority of the nodes have approximately the same number of links, and it's impossible to find outliers, nodes that have many more or much fewer links than the average. If the society would be random, as Erdős and Rényi envisioned through their model, then most of us would have approximately the same number of friends. We would not have hugely popular individuals, and no individual would be left behind. When in the late 90s, I started to think about networks, I realized that despite the existence of an existing theory about random networks, we know very little about how real networks look like. Partly because random network theory was never confronted with reality, was never compared to the structure of real networks. So in the late 90s, we started to map out real networks. Our first choice was the World Wide Web. We wrote a little robot, a piece of software, that started from a certain web page and found out what are the links, where can you go from that page. Then it followed those links and found out what are the pages that you arrive to and what are their links, and step by step reconstructed a certain region of the World Wide Web. We did that because we thought that the World Wide Web to a high degree is random. So we wanted to check the predictions of the theory of Erdo Sherini. To our surprise, the network was, we found was drastically different from the one that the theory predicted. Instead of finding many web pages who had comparable number of links, we found that the vast majority of the web pages had only a few links, one or two, pointing at them. But there were a few hugely connected nodes, like Yahoo and Google, who had hundreds and thousands, millions, and in some cases hundreds of millions of links. This type of network, this very inhomogeneous network, where many small nodes coexist with 
a few very, very large hops could not be explained within the random network theory, we call these networks scale-free networks. The best way you want to think of a scale-free network is think of the airline network that you see on the back of the airline magazines, the back of your seats when you fly. You see a few major hubs holding together many, many small airports. That is what we see, what we saw, that, that is what we saw on the World Wide Web, and that's a structure that we later discovered to characterize many real networks. What does it mean to have a scale free network? The mathematical definition is that the distribution of the links per node follows what we call a power law distribution. That is very different from the Poisson we found or random network. One of the most important predictions a power law makes is that there are outliers in the system. There are a few very, very highly connected nodes. These are not exceptions, but they are expected to be there in these distributions. These outliers correspond to what we recognize as hubs in complex networks. And in the coming years, we and others discovered that these hubs and these scale free topologies are present in many, many real networks. These hubs are the very popular actors in Hollywood who play in a couple of many, many large movies and through them they link to many other actors. These hubs are ATP and ADP within our cells, molecules that are essential for providing energies to the reactions that our cells require, and through them they interact with many other molecules. These hubs are Google, Facebook, and Yahoo, the very, very pages that we all know about on the World Wide Web. And once these hubs are present, they really fundamentally influence the way the system behaves and the way the network looks like. Soon after the discovery of the scale-free property, we asked the question, is it possible that we have hubs in the systems mainly because humans like to build hubs? We like popular people, we like major airports, and so on. So therefore, we wanted to check whether our networks out there that we did not consciously build, and they may also have hubs. Such networks are within our cells, and within bacteria and other simple organisms, whose metabolic and protein interaction networks could be mapped out, have been mapped out, and once we analyze them, we realize they have roughly the same architecture as the World Wide Web, the Internet, or many other technical networks. This was rather surprising if you think about it, because the World Wide Web has a history of about 20 years, the, world, the Internet maybe 50 years, airline network 50 years. The networks within ourselves have, however, a history of 4 billion years. And over 4 billion years, the architecture that the cell develops is identical to the architecture we see today in the Internet or the World Wide Web. This study, however, has taken us in a very interesting direction. How do we think about human diseases in the context of the networks that describe the human cell? Through that, we realize that the best way to describe a disease is not through the mutations that the genes have, but rather to think about the networks that break down once a gene is not working properly. Let me provide a simple example. When you try to start your car in the morning and your lights don't come up, that could be viewed as a disease, like a cell is not doing some of its functions right. If you want to understand what's the problem, you take it to the mechanic, and he or she could immediately discover the problem by inspecting the network through which the electricity gets to your light bulbs. And the reason why the mechanic can fix right away your car is because he or she has the wiring diagram of your car, knows exactly how the pieces connect to each other, and there are multiple places where it could be a broken component, could be a broken fuse, the battery could not be working, the light bulb could be out, and very quickly can be checked and eventually fixed. The disease is not so different from the lights not going on in the morning in your car. At the end, most diseases are caused by some network within your cell. Some subnetwork is not working properly. And because all diseases can be reduced to different subnetworks of the big cellular network that we have in each of our cells, the diseases are not independent of each other. 
So one of the works we did in the lab is to understand how different diseases link to each other. Why do they link to each other? Because they have common genetic or acting the pairs of diseases that have a common genetic origin and therefore should be viewed and perhaps treated uh, together. There were lots of surprises on this map. It showed us linkages between diseases that are normally treated by different doctors in completely different departments of the hospital. It also showed us avenues how the same drugs could perhaps be used to treat diseases that were originally not designed for because the genetic origin of the two diseases is very common. The network approach also allows us to address a big dilemma of modern medicine and genetics. We have discovered many disease-associated mutations, yet we're finding that these mutations are responsible for only a very small percentage of the disease occurrence, a very small percentage of the effect. The question is, where does the rest come from? Let's take, for example, cancer. Two individuals with the same cancer could have completely different mutations in completely different genes, yet they have exactly the same phenotype, that is the same manifestation of the disease. How could we explain that? The network gives us the first step in this direction. It is not the genes that matter, but rather the function that is not there when a certain disease manifests itself. And there are many ways of breaking down the network such that a function disappears, in the same way as there are many ways of breaking down the electric wire of the car arriving to the same disease, which is the lights don't turn on. The network approach also allows us to, in, to integrate many other components that are known to be responsible for a disease. We know a very important component is the environmental factors. You know, the social factors. There is evidence that the social network, for example, could affect the, the obesity level of individuals. And by mapping out the disease modules, understanding the network behind each disease, and integrating within the network the environmental factors, the effect of nicotine, the effect of various gases in the environment, where do they interact with the molecules, are they really in the vicinity of the disease module, we are able to think of methodologies to systematically integrate this vast amount of knowledge. This part is still in dreams. And the reason why it's still a dream is because we don't have yet ways of quantifying the environmental factors in such, with such a preciseness as we can talk about the networks within ourselves. But at least we see what we need. And the knowledge of what we're missing is very important for filling in this gap. Traditionally, academia works in silos, which means that we have our departments, our research groups, and we tend to focus on the particular narrow subject that we are expert in. The problem is that disease doesn't look at those silos. It doesn't care about that. And many complex systems that are around us are really not particularly infected by those silos. Their, their, their emergence. Their behavior is determined by many different factors that do not reside within a single discipline. So therefore, to address complex problems like cancer, like uh, environmental issues, the, the uh, speciation and so on, we need to have a truly interdisciplinary approach. It requires medical doctors to help us understand the nature of the disease as we know it. It requires computer scientists to quantify the data and collect and organize the data that we can get about that particular disease and about the patients who have it. It requires physicists and mathematicians to organize this information into predictive laws. And it requires, once again, experimentalists, biologists, geneticists to test these predictions on, in the real environment. So science is really converging towards uh, an environment in which much of the big questions cannot be solved unless we work together. Naturally, the scientific enterprise, the organization of, uh, of science, is to a certain degree resisting these, uh, uh, these attempts to bring different groups together. But I think in the last kind of 10 years, there have been major advances to try to make this interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity possible.
In the last decade, my group has worked on a wide variety of problems, from economic problems, understanding import-export relationships between countries, to human diseases, all the way to human mobility, social problems, and so on. Through that, we collaborated with lots of individuals. And the question is, how can we do that? Because obviously, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a medical doctor, and neither do I know much about human behavior other than observing what's happening uh, around me. What I used to say at the beginning of these collaborations is that a truly successful interdisciplinary work should not assume that the role of every single participant is to solve the problem of one particular discipline. There's no way myself as a physicist could ever cure cancer. And you don't want your cancer to be cured by me. You want to see a cancer specialist for that. The best interdisciplinary research is done when different disciplines come together and they arrive halfway and identify problems that are of importance for both disciplines, challenge for both of them, on which they actually willing to work together. Much of the network-related work we did in the last decade were not part of the traditional quorum, neither of biology nor of physics. They are, part, they are part of it now. And they have their own intellectual challenges and their own interesting questions. And we arrived to these questions by working with different disciplines, by understanding their needs, understanding the set of tools and their development that we have, and finding the next frontier that is worthwhile to attack from which both or multiple disciplines could benefit. I started thinking about networks fresh out of graduate school. A big impetus was when I went to IBM in 1994, and I became curious what IBM does. And through reading computer science books, I realized there are major questions related to networks that we physicists, or in many other disciplines, we don't understand. Yet, it took me five more years to publish my first paper on the subject. It wasn't because I didn't try. My first paper on networks was written in 1995, I believe. It's out there on the web. It's available, but never got published officially. Not because I didn't submit it to journals. I did submit it to five journals. But all the referees said, why do we care? Yet, I persisted. And five years later, we managed to publish a series of papers on networks that in many ways have changed our perspective of how we think about complex systems. In my mind, it shows that if you think that you have a good idea, A, you should not expect that the community will jump up and down in happiness of what great idea you did had. The instant success comes only in areas where you are solving a problem that everybody agrees ahead of time that that is a major problem. And if you manage to find a satisfactory solution to that, you will get perhaps instant reward. But the most influential discoveries are those that were not known problem at the time when they were addressed by the community. If you think about it, when Einstein came out with reality, he was not addressing an imminent need. Nobody was thinking about relativity, about the problem he was addressing. But by him addressing the problem, posing it in a mathematical way, years later, and it took many years for that knowledge to percolate, people realized this was a very fundamental contribution that without which we cannot be. And now, obviously, it's part of the core of physics. And so therefore, if I believe that, and this is something that I tell to my students, if you think that you really have an idea, don't get yourself discouraged by what the community will tell you. Because if that idea is really new, then it's very unlikely that you will get support from the community because the community is not ready for that. In the same way as in 1994 and 1995, the scientific community simply was not ready for networks. But they were absolutely ready five years later. It is always difficult to call my own work a paradigm shift. So let me tell you what I think that we did in this case. We provided tools through, 
which people could view the subjects and the problems they care about in a new perspective. We did not discover networks. Networks were there way before us, and many other people thought about that in way or the other. What we did is that we provided the narrative of how you look at the network, how you analyze it. Once you are given a network, what are the type of questions you would ask that really matter, and what are the questions that don't have an answer at all or may be irrelevant in a network context. Through that, the set of tools that we, and why we mean my group, and as well as the network science community at large has developed in the last 10 years, has managed to revolutionize a number of fields, from cell biology, where network thinking is a day-to-day -day tool now, to computer science, which cannot be these days, neither in the World Wide Web nor in the uh, Facebook area, without thinking actively about networks. And I believe that it will also come around and revolutionize many other fields, from economics, for example, that really is dealing with very interconnected economic entities and where the network aspect has been largely ignored by the community, through other disciplines that have not yet been quantitative enough to embrace networks, but once the data emerges, they will have to develop a network-based thinking about their area. Every time you feel that you made a discovery, you would hope that the community would come around and embrace it. But the reality is much more nuanced and much more complicated. The more important the discovery is, the most likely there will be some who will embrace it. But at the same time, there will be some who will either call it trivial, or we knew it all along, or simply not important. After the discovery of scale networks, we had the full spectrum. We had lots of individuals who embraced the uh, subject, and they carried it further. And thanks to them, we have a field of network science. And then we had some who questions both, both its correctness as well as its long-term importance. It's not for me to judge whether they were right, but I also know that many of the critics we ha faced at the beginning really were rooted in not understanding what we're talking about. And I could really associate with that feeling whenever it, someone comes along and say, hey, I'm telling you something fundamental about the subject that you've been thinking about for a long time you know, the first question is, what is that you would know that I wouldn't know? Let me take the example of sociology. The truth is that sociology, since the 1930s and 40s, had taught a lot about networks. They had published many papers. They had journals called social networks. And for good reasons, they felt social networks in particular and networks in general is their own discipline. And it is. There's no question about that. And we borrowed lots of tools that developed during these decades that now incorporated into network science. But at the same time, back then, sociology had a major methodological limitation. They could not collect data about large social networks. This was before the era of Facebook, before of the era of social networking and internet. So much of the sociological research on networks has focused on small communities, 10, 20, 30 people, and the social links they had between them. So there was no way with these data that they could have discovered the type of things that we focused on in network science, which is the properties of large networks. And it's not that there were a bunch of geniuses coming around at the end of 1990s and telling everyone, hey, there are networks over here. It's simply the data became available for us to look at the properties of these networks. And once we did, certain properties were obviously there. And you know, it was kind of unmistakable that you have to rewrite the way we think about networks. Given that background, I'm not at all surprised that early on there was resistance to these ideas. But now, 10 years later, 15 years later, what we learned is that the different ideas about networks can and must coexist in a very helpful way. As I mentioned earlier, we did borrow in network science lots of tools that sociologists and graph theorists have developed way before we even started thinking about networks. 
as well as these communities have learned to appreciate that the type of questions we're talking about is not superseding the earlier work. It rather complements it. Uh, I'm Hungarian. To be precise, I'm Transylvanian. I grew up in Romania, but uh, I grew up in a Hungarian family and my culture is fundamentally Hungarian. And of course, it goes without saying that in particular in network science, there have been a number of major mathematical contributions. Starting with Poya, who is one of the fathers of graph theory, to uh, Erdős and Rényi, who in the 1960s introduced the random network theory, to more recently uh, Laszlo Lovas, who just got the uh, Japan Prize for his contributions to graph theory, as well as Andres Semaradi, who got the Abel Prize, the Mathematics Nobel Prize, just last year, again for contributions to graph theory. Within that background, one would think that I must have had a great training in graph theory, and this is, I'm a natural continuation of this school. I do consider myself being part of this school, despite the fact that I've never in my life taken a course in graph theory, nor did I know about these contributions when I started to think about uh, networks. I learned only later through the work of Bela Bolovash, another giant of uh, graph theory, once I was already thinking about the problem as I was learning the tools that really mat Hungarian mathematicians had such a great contribution to the field. Was it an accident? It's really hard to know that. What I know for sure is that in Hungary, science has always been viewed as something, uh, as a matter of pride for the nation. So I consider myself primarily a scientist who happened to stumble across the problem of networks, which happens to be well populated by very famous contributions by Hungarians. I grew up in a family of writers. My mother was a literature professor who became later a children's theater director. My father was a historian who's written many books. So writing was somehow part of what our family did. Literature was part of what our family did. Soon after high school, when I was in college as an undergraduate, I started working for a Hungarian daily in Romania, the only, well, actually a Hungarian weekly, uh, writing about science, interpreting the results of science towards the general public. So when network science came along, I felt a need to translate the knowledge that we were gaining within the labs towards the general public. The public. I really felt that there are a number of hugely important discoveries that are being born through my colleagues in my lab and through uh, papers that I had access to that are very important to everyone who deals with networks, and that's virtually all of us. Yet, they have not really broken out of the narrow discipline that we're part of. This was the motivation why I ended up writing Linked my first general audience book, and eventually was followed by bursts. Link focuses on networks, the network science, network structure, and how they change our life. Burst would focus what we call today big data, even though it doesn't call it that way because it's preceded that term. And it focuses about the questions that are really on everybody's mind these days with the NSF spying, NSA spying scandal about what data really tell us about us, how we can really extract human behavior mobility from this big data, how predictable we are. When I wrote Ringed, I always thought that this would be part of a trilogy. And two volumes are out. The third is to be written. Uh, and let me keep the subject secret for that, but the, there's a plan for that. In addition to general audience writing, I also write for my no, narrow technical audience, my colleagues in network science, and now I'm actually engaged in a very interesting project of writing a technical introductory course about network science. Six chapters of that are already available because I'm making it available on the web. We have an iPad version that is interactive, and there's PDF versions as well, and I'm hoping that by the end of the year, we'll finish all 10 chapters. For me, this is a paradigm change because I realized that 
I simply don't have the time anymore to sit down and write from the beginning to end a book. And what a waste of not really sharing what I've already written with the community, with people who want to teach this material. So that's why I started to share the material chapter by chapter. And that became, in a way, a project of its own. Now the project has taken its second phase. Once I realize that I am already sharing this material to everyone, we realize, why are we doing only this in English? Why don't we do it in all possible languages? So now all over the world, groups, volunteers are forming who are translating the book as the chapters come out on their own languages. The first pilot project in Hungarian is already available, chapter one. And we have about seven countries who already signed up to form groups. And eventually the goal is to have a network science introductory book with interactive examples, homeworks, uh, slides, and everything that would be available in every language where there's interest in the subject. So my first technical book was really my PhD thesis. It was called Fractal Concepts in Surface Growth, and I wrote it together with my advisor, Jim Stanley. And it was part of my three-year PhD, the last year I really kind of focused entirely on writing this introductory textbook of teaching how to use fractal concepts to think about rough surfaces and so on. In a way, that was a wonderful lesson. I learned a lot from Jean Stanley and also a lesson to myself. You know, I was barely 25 years, 26 year old that, A, I can do it with professional help like Jean Stanley provided to me and B, that there is a value of communicating the knowledge that we collect towards our colleagues. In many ways, the network science textbook that I'm writing is an intellectual continuation of that process.